Um, thank you, uh, Chairman Handy and other members of the committee. It's a pleasure to be here um, today. We've been before other mem other uh, committees of the legislature, and uh, very pleased to be before the Environmental Committee. Um, thank you, Dr. Lutz. I think that's the the data on transportation uh, is becoming more and more known, um, more and more public that the impact that transportation has on on the environment, on the economy, on our quality of life, um, it, is a, it is an impact. It does have a major impact. And arguably, um, there's no greater potential for impact on our environment today than transportation policy. And I say potential because I think that can go one of two ways. Um, it, it can be a, both a positive impact or it can be a negative impact or probably both, depending on how transportation policy unfolds. We, um, we here in the Northeast are a little bit different than other areas of the country. Um, and this is not just a challenge for Rhode Island. It's a challenge for this country. It's a challenge for um, across the globe um, how we're going to um, uh, treat transportation growth and changes in technology going forward because it does have an impact on, on all aspects of our life, of our lives. Um, arguably, um, and I suppose it is arguable, but there's probably no greater um, public initiative in the last hundred years anywhere in the world than the development of the interstate highway system in this country. Um, much of our current economy is based on the development of that system, um, both good and bad. Um, it, you know, it's very much some unintended consequences, negative consequences of the development, but the growth, economic growth of this country is very much tied to um, that mobility. Um, but it's a limiting, it's a limiting opportunity. Um, other parts of the country um, are still in growth area with regard to highway use, but really not in the Northeast. Um, we have a mature highway system, um, and it is unlikely that any significant growth in the Northeast is going to be possible through expansion of our highway system. But the existing highway system is part of our daily lives. It's part of how we move around. It's part of how transit works effectively and how transit will work more effectively in the future. So I don't think anybody's suggesting that the highway system is going to evaporate anytime soon. What may change, and what will likely change, is the type of vehicle that's on that highway system, um, which could have some very positive effects on environmental effects. Um, there may be some unintended consequences that we're not even aware of yet as a result of the rapid development of alternative technologies. Um, but I think that's, that's um, something that the future uh, with regard to the vehicles that will be using the highway system is, is here. We're starting to experience that now. I think it was Motor Trend Magazine's car of the year is the Chevy Volt. Um, and I don't think uh, even probably five years ago anybody would have predicted that. Um, and so that I think there is a greater recognition in, although it's got a long way to go, that um, the, even with the private automobile, there need to be improvements in, in, in how it impacts the environment. But coming back to where we are in the, in the Northeast, um, no matter how good, if you eliminate every internal combustion engine in the private automobile, the highway systems are limited in capacity. And we are, we are really in a mature system, as I said, in New England and Rhode Island, that doesn't really provide opportunities for growth. And the growth is going to have to be multimodal. And, and Dr. Lutz referred to that. Um, I'm very pleased to say that on next Monday morning, the expansion of commuter rail from Boston down through Providence to TF Green Airport will, will begin operations. Um, and that was a, a long time in planning, a long time in development, but I think it's a, it is a, it's a step in the direction that we have to go regionally, locally and regionally, for expanding um, transportation options, providing opportunities that other than the private automobile for um, longer distance travel. Um, and the expansion of commuter rail is not going to mean that buses aren't needed. Um, and, and John Rupp from RIPTA will be here to discuss um, discover, uh, discuss RIPTA's um, opportunities and issues um, in a few minutes. What we clearly have to recognize that this is our challenges are multimodal. We need to, the, the private automobile is not going to go away in this country 
we are too spread out um, uh, geographically. Um, but we need to be providing alternatives that may, that are economically, environmentally, um, socially um, sensible, sensible. And I think we are beginning to make strides in that direction. Um, and there's more of a recognition that um, those opportunities uh, uh, need to avail themselves. So I think that there is, there is progress. All of this comes at a cost. Um, the investment in the, even our existing infrastructure, if Rhode Island were to never build another, add any additional capacity to its roadway system, to its highway system, just to stay the course, just to keep what we have today in a state of good repair, um, would has been estimated through the studies that were done um, through the Governor's Blue Ribbon Panel of, of 2008, over a 10-year period, just on the highways and bridges, let alone the transit um, infrastructure, we're three billion dollars short of what we're currently investing, just to keep the roads and bridges in good repair. The impact of that, one of the impacts of that, became um, uh, became realized over the last couple of years because of a bridge closing or posting on Phoenix Ave. Um, that because it was structurally deficient, the weight limit had to be placed on that bridge. Ripped buses had to be detoured off of that roadway, off of that bridge. And the operating cost, the added operating cost to RIPTA, just because of that one detour, was in the order of magnitude of three to four hundred thousand dollars for one fiscal year. So there's an enormous economic impact, even in our transit operations, by our limited ability to invest in just maintaining and rehabilitating our existing infrastructure. So that, that is something we all have to face. The um, Amtrak, you may all be aware, Amtrak recently came out, probably about two months ago, with a, um, a vision for high-speed rail, true high-speed rail, on the Northeast Corridor. And uh, the idea was to really be competitive with the regional airline market um, because of travel times between Boston, New York, Washington, and that corridor are, could be very competitive with the airline industry um, if you had European-style high-speed rail. Um, the price tag on that is on the north side of $100 billion over many or multiple years. So there are, there are opportunities to change. Um, but they come at a cost, and we, need, we as a society need to be thinking about what are we investing in our transportation systems that, whether they be the road, the bus, the rail, or air or water, that enable us as an economy to grow without having the same kind of adverse impacts on the, on the environment that I think has occurred over the last century. Um, so those, those are tough challenges. Uh, you know, the, the, um, a uh, hundred billion dollars is, you know, it's a couple of zeros beyond of what even I'm used to. Um, and so, and that's just for one system. That's not maintaining the existing Northeast Corridor that is so critical to regional rail transit between Providence and New Haven and New York and Boston, or points north, Portland, Maine. So I think these are, these are investment challenges that we are going to have to face, that you are going to have to face. Um, in the coming years, but we, we, I think we need to do it in a, in a multimodal mindset. It's not an either-or proposition. It's a what's the best fit, um, and both in what are we doing to maintain our existing infrastructure, but how are we planning for the future and keep get to incentivize people to be, get out of their cars and onto transit where it makes sense. And where it doesn't, where it makes sense to use a bus, should we have the systems in place that there's a bus available? Where it doesn't make sense, economic sense, for a bus to be in place, do we have a train available? And where that doesn't make sense, what are we doing um, to provide alternatives? So I think, um, as I said, we're at, a, we're at a, um, a decision point, I think, nationally, and certainly reflected here in Rhode Island as well. Um, what are we doing for the next 100 years with regards to the transportation? Um, and there, is, there are limited, limited growth opportunities in our highway system. Um, it's a different issue, I think, if you're in um, Arizona than if you're in um, Vermont. But um, I think there have to be regionally and locally based decisions and the flexibility provided so that the states can make those decisions that best fit 
um, their situation. Our situation here in Rhode Island is very different than Utah's situation. Um, so it has to be, the policies have to fit the region. Um, I think if we can, John, if we can click down, um, I just want to go to my the infamous bucket chart. Okay. This chart um, you may have seen before. It's out of the Blue Ribbon Panel Report of 2008. This, the, there's an analogous um, chart um, for RIPTA, and I think John will probably um, talk to this. But this, this top figure shows those three buckets on the top um, figure. Those are the s only sources of revenue that come into Rhode Island for road and bridge infrastructure. The leftmost bucket is our federal program. This is what we get from the Federal Highway Administration. It's, it, it's funded through the Highway Trust Fund. It is distributed by a formula program to each of the states based on a formula that is, I'm not sure that Isaac Newton could figure out, but there is an existing formula in law. Um, Rhode Island is actually gets quite a, a good return from the Highway Trust Fund. That money comes with a string attached to it. That is, the states get to spend that money with a local match, and the local match is 80 percent, and so Rhode Island has to come up with 80 percent in order to make access to that roughly $200 billion a year from the federal program. The way we have historically done that in Rhode Island for decades is to borrow. We borrow our local match um, to provide, to get access to that federal, federal revenue. Um, without that borrowing, we would not get access to the federal money. So that every two years we go through a bond referendum and the voters, by and large, pretty overwhelmingly past that, which is great because it, able, it enables us to invest in that existing infrastructure, but it comes at a cost. The bucket on the far right on top is the state gas tax. That is the sole source of revenue for, um, for transportation, highways and bridge transportation in Rhode Island. Part of that gas tax, and it's about 33 cents, I believe, today, about 20.75 cents, 21.75 cents comes to RIDOT for road and bridge infrastructure. The balance goes to RIPTA um, for transit operations. So that is split up front. So we're in, it, it, there's a forced competition between highway and bridge infrastructure and running the transit operation. And I think that's something John can talk to um, when he comes up as well. Now, of those three revenue sources, that those monies go to the three buckets just below them. On the far left is our capital program. It's what we invest on an annual basis to rehabilitate our road and bridge infrastructure. And you can see it's made up of the green from the federal program and the blue from the bond funds. So it's a, it, it equals, about, again, about $200 million a year invested in our road and bridge infrastructure, rehabilitation and maintenance. Our bridges are, on average, over 50 years old. Um, I don't know how many of you are as close to 50 as I am, but we, we need some maintenance every year as well. So that's the, that's the situation we're in there. The middle bucket is perhaps the most challenging, and that is it's our debt service. It's what we have to pay because of the borrowing that we've done historically. And the reason that's a mixture between yellow and green is that in order to do these major projects um, that have been done in Rhode Island over the last decade, including the highway, including the freight rail improvement project, which has enabled, was critical to enable us to expand commuter rail um, in south of Providence. Um, and included the 403 project, providing better uh, highway access to Quonset, um, and included the rehabilitation of the Washington Bridge and the Sakonic Bridge. Um, we did not have the amount of money coming to this state from the federal program in order to do any of those projects without um, some innovative financing, and what was used here was called Garvey financing, so you're actually borrowing against future federal revenues. So for the next dozen or so years, about 50 million of our federal money that comes to the state is going to pay off the debt on that, on that borrowing. The yellow in that bucket is the first place any of our gas tax revenues goes, it has to go to our debt service to pay off the bonds that we issued in order to provide the match to the federal program. So that's our first obligation. Any of our gas tax that comes to DOT, first obligation is to go to pay off the debt service on the bonds. And that is about 50% of what we take in, order of magnitude. Um, so what's left is the far lower right bucket. That's all the money that is left to do all of the maintenance on all of our highway and bridge infrastructure, including plowing snow, filling potholes, cutting grass, picking up litter, um, paying for our electrical bills.